Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Monday Minutes. Today, I wanted to talk with you just a little bit about the two lectures that are going to be on your next exam, the histology lecture, which you viewed last week, and the integument lecture, which you'll be viewing this week. In the histology lecture, we talked about two of the four kinds of tissue that are found in the human body, epithelial tissue and connective tissue. These two tissue types, along with muscle tissue and nervous tissue, make up all of the organs and all of the organ systems within the human body. Now remember what tissue is. Tissue is simply a grouping of cells and extracellular matrix. All of the cells in a tissue are working towards the same goal. In other words, the tissue will have specific functions that it performs in the body. The extracellular matrix is what holds those cells together. In your notes, put a star next to the three places where epithelial tissue is found in the body. It covers the outer surface of our skin. It lines all of the hollow organs and hollow passageways within the body. And it forms all of the glands within the body. Epithelial tissue is made out of epithelial cells and again extracellular matrix. But what makes epithelial tissue unique among the four kinds of tissue is that the cells are very tightly packed against each other. They lay side by side with very little extracellular matrix around them. This looks different than the other kinds of cells in the other kinds of tissue. And it makes epithelial tissue directional. Remember in the lecture we discussed how these cells side by side will have an apical surface and a basal surface that's attached to a basement membrane. This anatomy, this structure of epithelial tissue helps it perform its functions. Epithelial tissue has four very specific jobs that it does in the body. Make sure you can list those functions and discuss them. You should also be able to list these other structural features of epithelial tissue. The fact that it's avascular, that it is extensively innervated, and highly regenerative. Be sure that you can describe how epithelial tissue is classified. Because as we discussed in the lecture, epithelial tissue takes multiple forms. In some locations, remember, it forms a single layer, and we refer to that as simple epithelium. In other parts of the body, it's formed in multiple layers, and we call that stratified epithelium. In addition to whether or not there is one layer or multiple layers, we also talked about how the cells can look very different in different types of epithelium. Remember, some epithelial cells are quite flattened. We call those squamous epithelial cells. If it's a single layer of squamous cells, we call it simple squamous epithelium. If there are multiple layers of squamous cells, it's called stratified squamous epithelium. There are cuboidal shaped epithelial cells and they have a centrally located nucleus. Again, simple and stratified. 
There are also columnar shaped epithelial cells with a nucleus that sits down on the basal side. Simple columnar and stratified columnar exist. In addition to these basic types of epithelial tissue, there are two types that don't fit neatly anywhere else. There's what we call pseudo-stratified columnar and transitional epithelium. Remember, pseudo-stratified looks like it has multiple layers, but in reality, there's only one layer of misshapen columnar cells. And because they're misshapen, the nuclei in those cells is found in different locations, as opposed to regular columnar epithelium, where the nuclei are found near the basal surface. Transitional epithelium is probably the most interesting from a functional standpoint because transitional epithelium has the property of stretch. Remember, transitional epithelium is what lines the urinary bladder and what allows the urinary bladder to expand, to stretch as it fills with urine. Be sure that you can distinguish between the two general types of glands that are found in the human body. Endocrine glands are the type that don't have a duct and secrete hormones into the blood. Remember, we just don't talk much about endocrine glands in this course, but you will learn more about them in the second half of Anatomy and Physiology. Exocrine glands we do focus heavily on. Exocrine glands are the kinds of glands that do have a duct and that secrete whatever material they make up through that duct onto the surface of nearby epithelium. As you're studying, be sure that you can talk through the different levels of classification of the exocrine glands, whether they are unicellular or multicellular, whether their duct system is simple or compound, whether they have an asinus that is tubular, asinar, or tubulo asinar and what those terms refer to regarding structure. And finally, what kind of secretion they use, merocrine, apocrine, or holocrine type. And that brings us to the second kind of tissue, which is connective tissue. In your notes, make sure you have that memory device written down to help you remember the names of the four kinds of tissue. That memory device is the word conmen. Con stands for connective and men stands for muscle, epithelial, nervous. Use that memory device to help you recall the four kinds of tissue in the human body. Connective tissue, like all tissue, is going to be composed of cells and extracellular matrix, just like epithelial tissue and just like the other kinds of tissue. The difference is going to be what kind of cells we see in connective tissue and how those cells are structured within the extracellular matrix. Connective tissue is going to look very different from epithelial tissue, and that's because connective tissue plays a very different role than epithelial tissue does. Connective tissue is often thought of as scaffolding within the body. It's there to support, to protect, and to bind together the physical structure of all of the various organs in the organ systems. There are many different structures in the body 
that are made of connective tissue, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, bone, adipose or fat tissue, and blood. So connective tissue is much more varied in its structure than epithelial tissue is. One of the biggest differences between connective tissue and epithelial tissue is the cell type. Remember, in epithelial tissue, we see an epithelial cell. Now we can take different shapes, squamous, cuboidal, columnar, and so on, but it's only one type of cell. In connective tissue, we see many different kinds of cells, different cells for all of the different structures that are made out of connective tissue. Ligaments and tendons contain fibroblast cells. Cartilage contains chondrocytes. Bone contains osteocytes. Adipose tissue contains adipocytes. And blood contains both erythrocytes, those are red blood cells, and leukocytes, those are white blood cells. It's because there are so many different structures made out of connective tissue in the body. It's because of that that we classify connective tissue into three very broad types. Be sure that you can list these broad types of connective tissue and which structures belong to each type. Connective tissue proper, supporting connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue. In the lecture, we spent the most time talking about connective tissue proper because there are the most structures in the body made out of connective tissue proper. Be sure that you can list the three kinds of loose connective tissue proper and the three kinds of dense connective tissue proper and what the primary differences are between loose and dense types. Be sure that you also know that cartilage and bone are made out of a different kind of connective tissue called supporting connective tissue, while blood and lymphatic fluid are called fluid connective tissue. That brings us to this week's lecture about the integument or the skin. Remember, the integument is not a tissue. The integument is an organ, in fact, the largest organ in the human body. Organs, remember, are made out of different kinds of tissue that all come together to perform a particular function in the body. The integument actually contains all four kinds of tissue. Depending on whether you're looking at the outer layer of the integument, called the epidermis, or the inner layer of the integument, called the dermis, you'll find epithelium, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Just like with epithelial tissue and connective tissue, be sure that you can list the functions of the integument and describe each of these functions in detail. When we say, for example, that the integument provides protection, be able to describe what it protects us from. Traumatic injury, chemical injury, the entry of various microbes into our body, and also protection from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Be sure that you can list these functions and describe them in detail. One of the things I always warn students about when they're learning about the integument 
is how easy it is to confuse the term epithelium with the term epidermis. Remember, epithelium is a type of tissue, while the epidermis is the outer layer of the integument. The integument contains epidermis and dermis. Below the integument, there's a layer called the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. Remember, the hypodermis is not part of the integument. It sits below the integument. While you're studying, be sure to make use of all of these pictures and diagrams and drawings that we used during this lecture. I think that these drawings really help us recall the differences between the epidermis and the dermis and what kind of structures are found in each layer. The integument is an organ and organs are made out of different kinds of tissue. When it comes to the epidermis in the integument, it's made out of stratified epithelial tissue. When it comes to the dermis, it's made out of connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. In the epidermis, again, stratified epithelial tissue, the kind of cell that we're going to find is a specialized kind of epithelial cell called a keratinocyte. There will be other kinds of cells scattered in and among the keratinocytes, but the epidermis is primarily made out of these specialized epithelial cells called keratinocytes. Keratinocytes, remember, get their name because of a protein that they produce called keratin. Like all epithelial tissue, the epidermis is made out of cells that are tightly packed together, side by side, with very little extracellular matrix. We can divide the epidermis into layers of particular kinds of cells. Remember, it all begins with the stem cells down in the stratum basale. Above those, are the cells of the stratum spinosum. These are the living keratinocytes, as well as additional cells, including melanocytes and the Merkel's cells that we discussed in lecture. Above the stratum spinosum is the stratum granulosum, where the keratinocytes start to degrade and die. Next comes the stratum lucidum. Remember, this layer is only found in the thick skin of the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Be sure you know the name of the compound that's found in stratum lucidum and its purpose. Finally, we get to the outer layer of the epidermis, which is the stratum corneum. Remember, this is many, many layers of flattened, dead keratinocytes that are packed with keratin and provide a protective barrier on the outside of the skin. The dermis is much thicker than the epidermis and is composed of different tissue types than the epidermis. While the epidermis is made out of epithelial tissue, the dermis contains connective tissue as well as muscle and nerve. Unlike epithelial tissue, which contains very little extracellular matrix, we see a substantial amount of extracellular matrix in connective tissue proper. Be sure that you can list the different types of protein fibers 
including the most abundant type, which is collagen, found in the dermis. The dermis contains two distinct layers, the papillary layer, which is the one closest to the epidermis, and the reticular layer, which is the wider layer of the dermis. It's in that reticular layer where we find dense, irregular connective tissue proper and all of those accessory structures that we associate with the integument, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, nerve endings, and blood vessels. Epidermis, papillary dermis, and reticular dermis. These are the layers of the integument. The hypodermis lies below the integument and is not part of the integument. Toward the end of the integument lecture, we talked about some physiological processes that are very practical when we discuss the integument. We talked about the stages of wound repair. Be sure you can list those and discuss what happens at each stage. We also talked about the process of inflammation and the four signs of inflammation. Be sure you can list those. We talked about hemoglobin and the clinical state called cyanosis. Be sure you can explain where cyanosis comes from. We talked about the three most common types of skin cancer and how they differ from each other. Regarding melanoma, we talked about this A, B, C, D, E system. Be sure that you can list what A, B, C, D, E stands for and why we use this system to help us determine whether or not a lesion on the skin needs to be examined by a physician. We talked about burns to the integument and the different degrees of burns. We talked about the things that cause these burns. Be sure you can compare and contrast the degrees of burns. Be sure that you can explain the rule of nines and how it is that we use it to determine the prognosis for different kinds of burns across different percentages of the human body. And that brings us to the end of the integument lecture and the end of this week's Monday Minutes. Remember, if you have any questions about the material, be sure to message me through Canvas. And remember also to go to our discussion board this week and take advantage of some prompts, some essay prompts that will help prepare you for the essay questions on the next exam.